Okay, well, um, as Mary said, I am very pleased and grateful for you joining us. And it is a big gift, um, again, to be with you and to be learning with you um, as we prepare for the birth of our Lord, right? And um, providentially, providentially, this, this topic, you know, it was really now I think, um, you know, as I was preparing, like almost suggested by my angel, because today's gospel reading uh, involves an angel, yesterday's gospel reading involved an angel, and tomorrow's gospel reading will involve an angel. And I thought, wow, you know, that cannot be chance. That is definitely the providence of God, that we would be speaking about angels, and we're you know, encapsulated by these gospel readings about angels. So, um, you know, I was asking my angel, I'm like, how should I begin? And when I saw this, I said, you know what, let's look at what we can uh, glean, what we can understand from these readings, what they're telling us about angels. Um, you know, it's good to get into an understanding of what an angel is. What is an angel? Okay. So um, first, the catechism tells us that we can be assured that um, that angels exist. It's the truth of our faiths. You know, sometimes we think because there's many people who, um, you know, might not be believers, but they really have an affection for angels or they believe in angels. And so then that might make us a bit weary, like, but are angels part of our faith? You know, angels are absolutely a part of our faith. They're witnessed to in scripture, as I just mentioned, and we're going to see. And they're also witnessed through the, all of our tradition. The tradition of the Catholic Church is we believe in the existence of angels and in their influence on human life. Okay, so this is actually a part of our faith. We understand angels to be um, spiritual. That means they have no body. So, you know, a bigger term for that is non-corporeal. They, they just do not have a body. They're pure spirit. And um, St. Augustine teaches us something, which is kind of interesting, um, that the term angel actually refers to what they do. Uh, they're messengers. Their nature is spirit. So sometimes when we think we're saying angel, we're referring to the nature, but Really, what we're speaking about is what they do, the office, the mission of the angel. They are messengers, okay? So they are servants and messengers of God, you know? And in Matthew 18, we're told that they behold the face of the Father, right? They are mighty ones who do his word, hearkening to hear the voice of his word, okay? Uh, so... Now let's look at what these three gospel passages uh, say to us. So yesterday we had, uh, in, I'm not going to read the whole verse, but the whole the, the gospel reading for yesterday was Matthew 1.18, for those of you who might want to reread it. Um, and we hear that an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. And then there's a part that I didn't quote. And then the final part is, when Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. So what do we see here? When the, when the angel refers to Joseph as son of David, it's already telling us something. It's telling us that angels see the big picture. They know who we are. They know our ancestry. They know our history. They know where we come from. This is going to be important when we're speaking about our own guardian angel, right? Angels know who we are. They know who we are. They know where we are, where we come from. Okay. Uh, they know our concerns. The angel says to him, do not be afraid. They know our relations. They speak uh, to take Mary, your wife, into your home. They know our family structure. They know where we're situated. And then we see what's Joseph, 
what's his response to the angel? He awakes. He trusts his dream. He believes in his dream. He doesn't say, oh, no, it's just a dream. I must have not. You know, he trusts in his dream. And he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Okay, so there's this obedience of Joseph, right? Joseph is, you know, barring Mary, the greatest of all saints. He is the exemplar of what it means to be, you know, a father, what it means to be a worker. And he listens and he does so without delay, right? So Joseph is also teaching us how to respond to angels in our life, the obedience of Joseph. Then if we look at the gospel today, we're looking at Luke 1, 5 to 25. I'm not, again, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I'm going to read specifically when it mentions the angel. And we're going to be talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, who, you know, do not have children are a righteous and holy couple. And Zechariah um, was chosen by Lot to offer. And this is what takes place. Then when the whole assembly of the people was praying outside at the hour of the incense offering, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled by what he saw, and fear came upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. At this point, the angel will go on and tell him of the greatness of John's mission and how he will bring joy to the people of God and prepare a way for the Lord. And then I'm I'm going to go to the part where Zachariah's response to the angel is, then Zachariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said to him in reply, I am Gabriel, who stand before God. I was sent to speak to you and to announce to you this good news. But now you will be speechless and unable to talk until the day the things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. So today's gospel is telling us, here we have Zachariah, and Zachariah is a holy man. He is a holy man. He is a practicing man. Him and his wife are faithful. And when an angel appears to him, we see he's troubled by what he sees and fear comes upon him. You know, this, this makes a lot of sense when we read about angels and their nature, also what the saints have revealed to us. Angels are mighty. They are powerful. They are intimidating. They are so great and so majestic. You know, uh, there are saints who have mentioned, you know, seeing certain angels, they, they said if they were not believers, they would think they were demigods. I mean, they are powerful beings. So here's Zechariah, a man of great faith. But when he sees an angel, he is taken by fear. And here again, we see the, the angel immediately. You know, there's no pause. It says, do not be afraid. The angels know our emotions. They can perceive them with ease. They can know what we're about. They know what's concerning us. And again, he says, "You, uh, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son because your prayer has been heard. The angels know. They know what we seek. They know what we desire. And these are angels. They are 
serving the Lord and the angels reassuring him, you know, this is a great joy, a good news. Your prayer has been heard. I mean, how we long, how we long sometimes to hear those words. And yet Zechariah says, you know, how shall I know this? You know, he's saying, humanly speaking, I'm old and my wife is also old. This does not seem possible. And here again, the angel's response tells us about the dignity and the majesty of an angel. He says, I am Gabriel who stand before God. You know, he's laying out pretty clear. Do you know who I am? Do you realize I see the face of God? And you're questioning as if my message, remember Augustine uh, it taught us that, you know, that's what they do. They give us messages from God. And he's saying, you're questioning if I'm speaking truth to you. And he says, I was sent to speak to you and to announce to you this good news, but now you will be speechless and unable to talk until the day the things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. So the angel literally is almost like a mouthpiece of God. You know, the angel's will is aligned to God's will. And so our, our scripture today is telling us, when your angel speaks, listen. Don't start saying, well, is this going to work? You know, and, and this is not to bring down Zachariah because he's a man of great faith. He's the father of John the Baptist. But it's to humble us to say, if Zechariah could be ill-prepared for the, for the reception of good news, we could easily find ourselves there. Sometimes we've been praying and praying, and when God answers, we say, well, how do I know? How do I know if God answered me? Or how do I know? Maybe it's coincidence, you know, because we lose faith. We pray, but... We pray, do we pray expecting a response from God? You know, so this reading today tells us when your angel speaks, listen, listen. Now we're going to look at tomorrow. Tomorrow's gospel is going to be Luke 1. 26 38 i'm not going to read the whole thing but again the parts that you know are more drawn to um reflecting on an angel in the sixth month the angel gabriel was sent from god to a town of galilee called nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named joseph of the house of david and the virgin's name was mary and coming to her he said Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And then he, you know, he continues and he, you know, he tells her how she's been chosen and how the witness to her being chosen to be the mother of the Savior is the conception already, the gestation of John the Baptist uh, in its sixth month. And Mary responds, you know, very similar. We already, you know, what does Mary say? Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. 
Then the angel departed from her. So here we see that the angel, the angel, this is the angel Gabriel who sees the face of God. And he says to Mary, hail, full of grace, hail. That is a, a term of reverence. He's acknowledging her. He's acknowledging her greatness, you know, and what is impressive to the angelic realm? Who do the angels consider people of influence when they look down on earth? They consider people of influence to be those who love most, those who know how to allow the Trinity to live in them and love through them. And who is greater at this than our mother? She is par excellence, par excellence, the creature who knew how to love the most, you know, excluding Christ who has, you know, hypostasis. But in her humanity, apart from Christ, there was no one who loved as Mary did. No one who loved as Mary did. In fact, um, I think we talked upon, we touched upon this, but uh, perhaps, um, if not last talk, but another time, one of Mary's titles is Mirror of Justice. And what does that mean? It means she reflects, she reflects perfectly what is owed to God and what is owed to others. You know, she is the mirror of the justice of Christ. You know, another title of Mary is, uh, is Queen of Angels. So it tells you why the angel is saying to her, hail, full of grace. You are full of the life of the Trinity. And though, even though I am majestic and I am an angel and I am great, I defer to you. I recognize, I recognize God's work in you. And I recognize your complete submission to that work. And this makes you great, a marvel a marvel of all created beings, both human and angelic. And what's Mary's response? It's very, uh, you know, familiar. It's, it's similar, it's greater, but it is still similar uh, to that of Joseph as compared to Zachariah. You know, Joseph, obedience. He gets up, he does what the angel said. Zachariah was afraid, could not believe, could not believe. He came to faith. He came to faith over time. And here we have Mary. Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. You know, complete fit. Yes, be it done. And the angel departed from her. Mission accomplished. She was ready for the yes. And what greater mission could there be than to be the mother of the savior? But she was ready. She was ready to receive. You know, it was always her mission, but she was ready to receive. She was ready to give the yes. So absolutely angels are part of our faith. They are, as we see, witnessed in scripture. They are um, testified throughout tradition, and they are majestical spiritual creatures. We also see that through these three readings. Um, in the Catechism, Article 331, it tells us that Christ is actually the center of the angelical world. All angels are his angels. They belong to him because they were created through him and for him. It also tells us that Christ has made angels messengers of his saving plan. In Hebrews 1.14, it says of angels, are they not then all ministering spirits sent forth to serve for the sake of those who are to obtain salvation? So this is speaking to us. Angels are ministering spirits and they're sent forth to serve those who are to obtain salvation, who would those be? It would be us. 
it would be the baptized. It would be those in the world who are of goodwill. It would be the members of the church and whatever place we find ourselves in, however um, our opinion is of ourselves, it is not God's opinion of us. Because in fact, he has sent these great creatures who have said yes. Remember, they have passed the test. These are all uh, angelic creatures who have said to God, yes, we will serve you. And we will serve you in, in the plan of salvation you have for humanity. So these are the victorious angelic beings. Uh, and they are made to serve us, to help us, to guide us, to shepherd us. Um, angels were there at the incarnation of Christ. They profess his resurrection. They'll be there when he returns and they'll be part of his judgment of us. So, you know, the question does come to us, why would angels be so concerned to help people? This says something about us, right? That we have these beautiful creatures that are so lofty, so powerful, so great. And they are intent and desiring to help us obtain salvation. In the Catechism in 336, it says, From the beginning of our life until our death, human life is surrounded by the watchful care and intercession of angels. That means from when you were conceived, from when you were conceived, from when you were a baby, from when you were born, your childhood, your, when you were a toddler, your infancy, you know, when you were a teenager, your whole life, your guardian angel's been with you. Your guardian angel knows your thoughts. He knows your hopes. He knows your dreams. He knows what you aspire to. Um, he's seen the good you've done. Um, he's seen where you have fallen and where you have repented and gotten back up. He's seen how you've been um, put to trial. Our angel knows everything about us. St. Basil says, beside each believer stands an angel as a protector and a shepherd leading him to life. So we can be confident we have our guardian angel with us. And in the same way, when, we're, when we are firm in our faith, when we're just seeking to live our faith, I would say, we can know with confidence that we're sharing the same faith as these angels. We're sharing the faith of the angels and we are united to God. So they are directing us towards this, this great, uh, I mean, ultimately everything the human person does when we really uh, decide to make Jesus the center of our life is to foster union with the Lord. And it's a great consolation to know I have a guardian angel that's been with me the whole time. And it's not only um, just the choice, you know, of course the angel does this willingly, but it's the desire of God that this angel be with me. Why would the Lord create an angel for each person? I mean, if you just think about that. It's billions of angels. There are billions, as many people as there are, there are, there are angels in the world. And these angels, um, you know, sometimes it seems difficult to believe that there could be all these angels with what we see, what's going on. But why would the human person have such a noble help, such a constant noble help? And it's because the human person is made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. You know, we've heard this term imago Dei, right? So what is the greatness of a human person? I was looking at my children watch this cartoon. It's a, it's a good cartoon. It's um, the uh, wild crats. So there's these two brothers and they have all these you know, they, they go to different animals and they, what they do is they investigate the animal and they talk about the creature powers, you know, of these different animals. And my children, when they watch the show, they're just enthralled, you know, they were watching a show yesterday about a hermit crab. And my five-year-old was like, mom, can you believe this hermit crab? 
it can, you know, carry its house on its back. It's, uh, you know, like, and, and, and one of the lines of these, you know, in this cartoon is, you know, I wish I had that creature power. And I was thinking how good it would be, you know, how good it would be maybe to have a cartoon where children can realize the greatness of the human person. Like what's, what's our great creature power? You know, it's not running like a cheetah. It's not swimming. I mean, even a guppy can swim better than us. It's not climbing a tree. It's not, I mean, there's really creatures can do amazing things. Uh, spiders, uh, we can't climb walls. We can't hold our breath that long underwater. We can't hold our breath that long anywhere. Um, but, you know, what's the great creature power of the human person? It's our capacity to love. That's our superpower. And that power is so important to God. That is what makes us in the image of God. You know, um, you know, Bishop Barron in the reflection and his rosary reflections, which are just amazing. And if you don't listen to them, I'd suggest you do so. Um, you know, he makes this reflection on how we, you know, our beauty fades, like our strength fades so quickly in this life. You know, what's the greatness of the human person? It's our capacity to love. And this, praise be to God, this capacity doesn't, you know, properly speaking, fade as quickly as our other, you could say, aces. You know, we are really capable of loving you know, it's not, it's not based on intelligence. It's not based on physical fitness. It's not, it's not based on even, um, uh, you know, obviously not position or wealth or anything of that sort, but what's this capacity to love based on? It's really based on my ability, you know, like my mother to give my yes to the Lord. It's really based on my capacity to say to the Lord, um, yes, Lord, I want, I want to follow you. I want to follow you, uh, you know, as you walk, you know, to Golgotha, I'm going to walk. I'm going to be that Simon the Simon. I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk with you. I know you're doing the greater part, but I want to do my small part because it's mine and it's for me to do. This is my mission and I want my mission accomplished before you judge me. You know, it's within my lifetime, Lord, I want to serve you. You know, this is one of the ways angels help us is the very fact that they are and are able to see the face of God is a witness to the fact that they said to God, I will serve. I will serve you, you know, so we can also see the wisdom and the humility of angels and it can encourage us when sometimes we say, Lord, this seems hard. It's hard to follow you here. It's hard to trust, you know, all the details, but just look at our three gospel, just looking briefly at three gospel readings we see they know what's going on in heaven about us. They know, you know, part of why it's difficult to trust God is we are tempted to think we are deceived. We are tempted. And then we give our yes to the temptation that the Lord doesn't know about me. Doesn't remember about me. Doesn't know where I am. If the Lord saw all the details of my life, he certainly couldn't ask this of me. Is the Lord hearing my prayer? You know, and here come these angels to say, your prayers are heard. Your prayers are answered when it's best for you. Your prayers are answered when it makes sense in God's plan of salvation for you, all those you love, and all those you don't love. Because we were made to love as Christ loves. That's why Mary is the creature par excellence. Because she loved 
completely, you know, completely. There was no, this is why the angel says to her, hail full of grace. What is he speaking about? You know, one of the simple definitions of grace that I give to children when I'm teaching catechesis is grace is the life of God in you. So she is full of the life of the Trinity. And who would know this better than an angel who sees the face of God? So he can look at Mary and say, I see God when I see you. And this is truly what our life is about. You know, our guardian angel needs to see us and see another Christ when he sees us. Not, you know, any random, but, you know, Christ in Celeste. You know, Christ in Mary, Christ in Cloud. Our, our angels will testify to our desire to love as God loved. And so, you know, when I was looking at my five-year-old marvel that, you know, a hermit crab can carry a shell. Yes, this is impressive because the shell is heavier than our house, proportionately speaking. And, you know, heavens knows I cannot lift this house. I can barely lift, you know, I can barely lift some of my children sometimes. Um, and how quickly, right? How quickly our, our physical capacity can, you know, uh, really decline but notwithstanding i know my capacity for love has increased and so where people see less i see more i say praise be to god you know sometimes my children they interrupt me so many times and i remember when my you know my first children interrupted me how difficult it was for me how incapable of love i used to be in those times and now i see the lord right? The Lord in his mercy. Because in my particular life, that's how the Lord has taught me to love. You know, the blessing of children that I say, no, I can be interrupted. The Lord knows I'm being interrupted. And the Lord is teaching me to break my will and listen to this child. Whereas before, you know, I used to, I used to yell at my children when they interrupted me in prayer, screaming, I need to pray. My children used to be <laughs> like, you know, who are you praying to? Like, what kind of God is this? If, you know, praying is causing you to scream, you know, and it was just with time that I realized this is a temptation, I, you know, and the Lord is patient with us. He knows these things, right? He knows these things about us. Even our guardian angels know about us. I mean, there's four basic temperaments. And so, you know, angels, they know, they know our temperament. They know if we're the type of person, you know, clerics are natural leaders and they know their, their talents and they like to command, but you know, they have the temptation to be proud um sanguine really love pleasing people but they can get easily distracted i'm sanguine if anyone knows <laughs> i'm a bit of cleric in me too though i can really get pretty feisty but you know i i i love to be with people i i, I can get easily distracted i can leave projects you know those are my temptations so um you know the flaws of my every temperament has like natural strengths natural weaknesses let's put it that way but our guardian angel knows us. They know us through and through. And so if we would learn to hear, hear the suggestion of our guardian angels, then we would really move ahead on our mission in accomplishing this great mission I have to love as myself. I need to love as Celeste was meant to love living in and for Christ and through Christ, you know, just being all about him and learning to love as I was called into existence to love. And then, right, then I'm called a saint, but essentially that's my creature power, right? And so, you know, the catechism reaffirms this. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. That's why human people have a guardian angel, because that is a great power. 
It is a tremendous power. There's nothing, there's no greater dignity that God could have given us than the capacity to love as God loves. St. Catherine of Siena says, what made you establish man in so great a dignity? Certainly the incalculable love by which you have looked on your creature in yourself. You are taken with love for her. For by love, indeed, you created her. By love, you have given her a being capable of tasting your eternal good. God has given us a nature, which is our body, because we're corporeal, and our soul together. So human nature is body and soul. Angels are only spirit. But God has given human nature a capacity of tasting the eternal goodness of God. I mean, really, what could get us down? if we claimed this birthright, if we claimed the grace of our baptism and leaned into it, what could really discourage me if I understood in my flesh that I am a daughter of a king and I am called to claim you know, my noble birthright to living in the kingdom. Now, you know, we're not, we're not to be holy only for heaven. The goal of working in relationship with our guardian angel is to get holy here so that we can further the kingdom you know, as women and men who know who they are. I know who I am and I know what makes me great. I am loved, my God, by God. The first article in the catechism, the very first article, the life of man is to know and love God. God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself. What does that mean? God was full. God did not create us out of need, but in a plan of sheer goodness because of the goodness of God. Freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. That's us. At every time and in every place. That means, you know, when I'm in a supermarket and I'm grumbling because someone cut me off or when there's not enough gas in my car or when I'm being falsely accused, when I'm being misjudged, I have this great and good God calling me to himself. And I have an angel beside me saying, be patient, be humble, be like your mother, be like St. Joseph. He calls man to seek him, to know him. God wants us to seek him out. How do we seek out God as a Catholic? Sacraments. Am, am, am I using the gifts of sacraments? You know, it's so important for us. We would understand why we had an angel. We need to be very aware of the fact that we live in a post-fallen creation. We don't need to look around at the world and say, why is it a mess? We need to look around at the world and say, God help me love more because love is the greatest means to bring order to the universe. Love is ordered because love gives God what God is due and gives our 
fellow man what he's do. When I know how to love my neighbor as I love myself for the sake of God, then I'm loving myself properly. I'm loving my brothers and sisters properly and generously. And I'm loving God first and foremost with all my mind, with all my heart, with all my strength. If I were about that, as my day unfolds, then nothing can take supernatural joy from me. Yes, I can be discouraged. I can experience physical pain. I can, I can, I can be weary. I can be tired, but I can be joyful because my call and who I am by my birthright through my baptism is greater than any trial I can experience. When we say here, God calls men to seek him, and we're, we're saying, how do I seek God? How do I seek God in a post-fallen creation? I know I need to pray. I know I need to pray. I know I need to be faithful to my times of prayer. And I know that I need the sacraments. And before I continue on the sacraments, we're, I'm going to move to who is Christ? You know, this is a question we can ask ourselves every day. Every day until we die, we will not exhaust this question. Who is Christ? Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. He has taken your place on the cross. I mean, if we really sat down and meditated on this every day, even a few minutes, we really understood, Lord, you are on that cross in my place. Lord, you came to save me. Right. It's so I would say I'm a Catholic revert. You know, I was always appeared Catholic, but that I really came to faith was in my early 20s. And the greatest thing that I understood when I came to faith, because I used to think the Lord came to save others. And, you know, me, not really. And I was kind of like his helper. But I only really fell in love with Christ when I understood, no, he came to save me. And how we need to understand, you know, that my sin alone was sufficient, was enough for the Lord. Never mind my sin, but his love for me was sufficient for him to be crucified. You know, because we look at it the other way around, but Christ came. Why did he come to become sin and to die an expiation for all sins, you know, throughout history that ever would be, that ever were. Why? For love of you, you know, for you personally. If you really understand that Jesus Christ died for you to save you and give you another opportunity to say yes to an eternal life with God, and that he is the way, he is the truth and the life, meaning he has taken on the consequences of sin. On top of this, he has established the church. And in this mother church, we have recourse to all the grace we need through the sacraments. We have recourse to the Christian community that we need as social beings, remember, human nature, unlike angels, they're non-corporeal, but we are body and soul. And our body, we, is animated completely. Our body and soul are one. I don't want you to think of them as separate. That's, that's a wrong thinking, we'd say, and that's like dualism. They're really one thing. And that's why when we die, um, you know, our, 
how, do, how does the human person die? We die when our body and soul are no longer united. That causes death for the human person. But when uh, at the final judgment, we will receive our bodies again. That's how sacred our bodies are. And we should not look at our bodies um, as uh, not, you know, unnecessary or um, kind of like added on or any kind of limitation. No, our body is not that. It will be glorified, but our body is absolutely holy, absolutely sacred. We are a temple of God, right? So unlike angels, we are body and soul, and we will remain that way for eternity. But when the Lord, when the Lord decided to enter human history, right? This is the incredible thing. This Christmas, you know, when you're looking at these nativity scenes, or you see a small baby boy, you know, it's really to marvel that such a powerful and majestic God that created all of the universe effortlessly out of complete and sheer goodness, love for us, love for the human person made all that is so that we could freely move in relationship and receive the gift of eternal life that God is offering us. You know, God wants to, wants us to be with him forever. And we have this freedom to receive that gift that was won for us through Christ. But when you look, you know, at, at, an, at a crush scene or you see a little boy, you see a little baby and you, you really realize God took on human nature. God became a baby, right? St. Therese of Lisieux said, you know, a God that could become a baby boy could only be pure love. You know, and sometimes I think we don't really, uh, you know, it's something else we really need to pray on is how God was so humble as to enter human history. This is the second person of the Trinity enters human history, takes on human nature. So when Jesus became human, he didn't absorb it into the divinity of the second person, but truly Jesus is 100% of whatever it means to be God and 100% of whatever it means to be human. So truly God, truly human, you know, he has a human soul, a human body, and the divine essence, and one person. So we have this baby that has one, is one person, human nature, and divine nature. You know, this is the same, whatever it means to be God, is equally present in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when the Archangel Gabriel says, you know, I am he that beholds the face of God. When Gabriel sees the Christ child, he's seeing the same God that he beholds in heaven. This is the humility of God. So the incarnation also, also witnesses to why the human person would be gifted with a guardian angel. So much that God has loved you, that God himself has taken on human nature. God is so intimate with us. You know, this is the beauty of Catholicism. We do not believe in a state or an impersonal God. We believe that the great God, the great I am that was in the burning bush became a baby boy. So understanding 
a bit more who Christ is, understanding the strength, the power, uh, the intelligence of angels, then we see, wow, if I'm really going to make use of what God has given me, which is my time on earth, to learn how to love, to learn how to love as he has created me to love, then I'm going to be very obedient to what has been laid out for me through tradition, through the example of the saints, through the sacraments, through the commandments, through the plethora of prayer, all the practices of prayer. We are so rich in our diverse practices of prayer, the different communities, the different charisms in our church, you know, that can really suit uh, the individual heart. Right? It's a matter of, you know, as we see God calling us to seek him, seek him in prayer. You know, discover the prayer type that works for you. Discover um, uh, a new form of a devotion to him, to know him, to love him with all our strength. God calls together all human people divided by sin into the unity of God's family, the church. So uh, just in this first article, we see that we all have one origin. Our origin is God. We're one family, right? Why is Christmas so um, lovely, even to non-Catholics? It's so attractive. There's something so attractive and lovely about it. It's because it's witnessing to the truth of the one human family. And it's witnessing to, you know, how did God come to conquer conquer sin, to conquer evil. God did not come with force. God did not come with strength. God came with humility, meekness, patience. Um, God abided with us, right? God is with us, right? This is what Emmanuel means, God with us. You know, so Jesus's name and his mission are the same. God is with us. Literally, God is with us. You know, and so as women and men who receive Christ in the Eucharist, what a consolation to know that I'm receiving God. I'm receiving God. You know, and so this really, I would say, you know, we started out our talk just with a little comment about the children and how our Christmas preparation is going, but, you know, let's make room internally for God in our lives, literally God within ourselves, right? Because when the fall took place, when sin entered the world through our human parents, right? It affected the whole unit, human family. And that is indicative. The fact that the whole human family was marked with original sin is a witness to our unity. You know, we were all marked because it's a witness to our unity, but we were all restored through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we cannot be people who lose faith, hope, or charity. That is precisely what we were called into existence to witness to, right? To receive the life of this loving God made flesh and to communicate this incredible life that God has shared with us to others so that we can become truly ourselves while we're given this time on earth. So it's not to be distracted by all the things we cannot do because they're simply not being asked of us, but it's to be very centered on what we can do. What can I do? And that's where our angels have this beautiful role of suggesting to us, you know, our, they, they suggest uh, images, they can suggest words, they can affect our um, 
our dreams, they can direct us. The more you develop your relationship with your angel, the more you will benefit from that uh, guardian and shepherd that the Lord has assigned to you. You know, invest in that relationship. How many of you have honestly spoken to your guardian angel? It's something we should actually do every day. It's something, you know, a saint, Francesca Romana, she used to read uh, the liturgy of the hours by the light of her guardian angel. I mean, this is a great grace, right? But this is, uh, you know, something that's possible to really seek an authentic and living relationship um, with our own angel. And, you know, when we understand how loved we are by God, then things make a lot of sense. It makes sense that the angels would be excited to help us, right? Because they also are loving. They also are these great non-corporeal non -corporeal beings who saw that the greatest thing to do was to serve God and God's saving plan. Um, so yes, I really do hope that this has allowed you to move a bit further into your understanding of angels into your understanding of yourself, your unique and singular mission you have as a member of the great human family that fell but has been redeemed by God, literally by God himself, and uh, that you would be greatly encouraged to say yes, as Mary did, to, to wake up as Joseph did and to do to do what is being suggested to you to do. You know, there are, I'm sure if you perhaps this evening, just reflect on your life and think of times that, you know, a thought has come to you and you and you have the humility to say, okay, I'm going to do it that way. And how fruitful it was. And then you realize, wow, that must have been my angel. You know, uh, a woman once said to me, I really love this one, but I won't mention her name. <laughs> she said to me, you know, she, I used to work with her and she said, oh, I forgot my umbrella. My angel told me, but I didn't listen. And, you know, this was many years ago. And I thought, honestly, your angel's telling you to bring your umbrella. And, um, but from that day, when I hear, when I, I feel like it's almost like a little voice or a mental suggestion, um, take that book or bring those keys, put your glasses away. Um, I do it. I do it. And it always pays off in spades. Always pays off in spades. You know, this, this is the shepherding, the directing of this great supernatural creature that loves us, that knows us, you know, that wants us to be, uh, fruitful and joyful. Uh, remember again, the quote of St. Irenaeus, the glory of God is man alive. You know, when we are in our place, oh, we are just a joy, a joy to others, a joy to ourselves, and a joy to God. You know, so it's just really it's to dig deeper. It's not to get distracted, but to be more committed, to be more committed. And, you know, in our own mission, ask, you know, guardian angel, what do you think? And you will have an inspiration. You will have perhaps a redirection and, um, and it will bear fruit if you have the capacity to trust you know, we don't need to understand all things before we move on, on an inspiration we, we can perceive is from uh, a good being, but not necessarily ourselves, right? And that comes with time. But if you really want to have your antenna up, you need to have your practice of prayer, your practice of you know, the sacramental life. I cannot emphasize confession and Eucharist enough. Like they're really like a hand in a glove. Confession, Eucharist, they are so life-giving. And then, of course, the other sacraments, as we're called. And then, you know, we need to go to Mass. We need community. 
you know, we need, we need our Catholic community. We are social beings, right? So we respect our, um, our corporeal nature, right? We need to be kind to ourselves. It also means we need to rest, you know, we need to rest. We need to have, uh, we need to take times of break, but we also need to be committed to the work that has been laid out for us. Um, God bless each of you. I hope that this talk helps you do that.